Hello, and welcome to today's Biodistic sponsored webinar. My name is Linda Trailer, and I am the Vice President of Clinical Development and Medical Affairs at Biodesics. It is my pr privilege to be today's moderator, which allows me the honor of introducing our speaker and topic, as well as facilitating the Q&A at the end of the program. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Let's see. A few housekeeping um, Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Biodesics website. Uh, and an automatic email will be sent to all registrants with the link to the recording. Um, as attendees, you are in listen-only mode. So to ask questions, please type your questions in the chat box and I will collate at the end of the program and read your questions to the speaker. Uh, if you are having any technical challenges, also feel free to tap, type that into the, the chat box and we will see if we can help resolve. Now, let me introduce our speaker. So our speaker today is Dr. Wallace Akerley, who is a professor of medicine at the, in the Division of Oncology at the University of Utah. Dr. Akerley attended his first ASCO in 1985 and was, asked, was very active in CalGB, the Cancer and Leukemia Group B, before the consolidation. He became the Chief of Medical Oncology and Professor of Medicine at Boston University before moving in 2002 to Utah, where he joined where Dr. Akerley joined the Huntsman Cancer Institute uh, at the University of Utah as the Director of Thoracic Oncology. He has also served uh, as the Director of Clinical Trials and Outcome Studies in the Huntsman and Mountain Cancer Care Program, the Senior Director of Clinical Research, the Director of Cancer, the Utah Cancer Registry, and the Senior Director of Community Oncology Research. You certainly get a sense of his passion for clinical research and those titles. Presently, he is Chair of the PRMC, which is a Scientific Review Committee, Director of the Lung Cancer Disease Center, and a member of NCCN's Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer Panel and Steering Committee. His current research interests include heredity and non-smoking lung cancer, radon awareness, sequencing of uh, combined uh, modality therapy, chemoimmunotherapy, and immune targeted therapy specifically, which you'll hear about today in the presentation, and rethinking the definition of performance status, which I think is a, a long overdue topic for discussion, uh, and you will also get his thoughts on that today in the presentation. The title of the presentation today is Real World Performance of Blood Based Host Immune Profiling in First Line immunotherapy treatment in advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer patients. So Dr. Akerley, I will turn this over to you. Uh, thank you very much. I, this is a topic that's very important to me as uh, Linda so kindly introduced me. Um, she mentioned that I've been an active in clinical research since the days of CALGB and uh, that's been my passion. That's all I've been really interested in. Uh, until the last few years, when we started to look at real world data and tried to understand why some patients do well and some patients don't do quite as well. So the topic here, three big points, real world performance, blood-based host immunoprofiling, and first-line immunotherapy in advanced non-small cell lung cancer. And the slides aren't jumping away, but I, my keyboard's not working, but I have a pen and that will work. So uh, disclosures are listed here. I have a number of clinical research studies ongoing. So where are we in this world? The complexity of managing cancer is just so overwhelming. Um, these are questions that the patient might ask. Do I have cancer? What's my prognosis? What will you treat me with? When can I start? And is it working? Well, those are the things the patient's asking us, but truthfully, we're asking the patient, we're asking ourselves uh, the answers to these questions also. How do we do this? Well, the way we do this at this point is diagnosis and staging. And well, even with diagnosis and staging, you end up with a bell-shaped curve, and some people are gonna do really well, and some people are gonna do really poorly. And, and why is that? Um, well, it turns out that bell-shaped curve isn't always just one bell-shaped curve. 
It's typically a group of bell-shaped curves, uh, as you see on the top, and typically a group of bell-shaped curves. Just a few years ago, we talked about non-small cell lung cancer, where we just focused on it wasn't small cell. It was a group of small cells, but it was immune profile that we now understand. There were KRASs and EGFRs and ALKs mixed in there. Um, if you can molecularly quantify those, you can come up with a more homogeneous population of patients. Um, or um, there's just heterogeneity and we don't understand it. And there are patients with good performance status or brain mets or something else. So how do we get a more tightly defined um, population of patients to better be able to prognosticate or predict the future? Well, biomarkers are the answer, and the biomarkers typically fall into two groups. There are biomarkers of the cancer itself, and typically, as I mentioned earlier, those are the ALK and EGFR kind of genes. But there's markers of the host and the host interaction uh, with the tumor. And we really haven't spent very much time on that. Performance status is the most important that we've included in clinical trials. So the host, um, as I said, performance status, it is the basis of all clinical trials. You can't get onto a clinical study without having someone score your performance status. There's a couple of versions of this. Uh, Karnowski set this off in the, in the 1940s, but the WHO and ECOG are the most commonly used now, and they're listed on the side. Um, they fall into two groups. They are patients reporting symptoms, um, and their symptoms describe their activity and the amount of time that they spend in bed. When one participates in a clinical study, only those patients who have typically a zero or a one are allowed to participate in clinical studies. Um, if you have a performance status two, um, you weren't allowed to participate in any of the immune clinical studies. So definitions here, zero is fully active. Uh, one has some restriction in physical activity, but you carry out like housework and, and you can do most of the things, including office work. A two is the patient is ambulatory and capable of self-care, but unable uh, to carry out work and um, they are out of bed more than 50% of the day. The distinction between three, a defining point of uh, who shouldn't even be treated, is you're in bed more than 50% of the day. So again, in the real world, just to hit this point for immunotherapy, zero one is allowed to participate in immunotherapy. However, real world, we take patients anywhere from PS zero to three. So here's the comparison of real world versus clinical trials. In the real world, we just said, we take performance status 0, 1, 2, 3. In a clinical trial, um, immunotherapy took only a 0 or a 1. Comorbid disease, in the real world, you got to take care of everybody. Comorbid disease, gee, if you have a sickness of... Um, of, of coronary disease or some other infection, you can't even consider, be considered for a clinical trial. If you're if in the real world, if a patient is in crisis, they've got um, an effusion that's overwhelming or a site of disease like meninges, um, those patients cannot participate in the clinical study. If they're short, short of breath or have a recent PE, they can't participate. You have to be clinically stable to participate in a clinical study. Um, if you're having rapid tumor growth and the doc is worried you need to be treated tomorrow, in a clinical trial, that just wouldn't be allowed to happen. Sometimes it can take up to a month and even six weeks to get on a clinical trial, depending on the complication of the eligibility and waiting periods and washout times. And then lastly, in the real world, you gotta deal with the natural history of the cancer. Um, in clinical trials, you are selecting for patients who have an aberrant history, um, right? A lung cancer patient typically is gonna be short of breath. Some studies don't allow patients to be on oxygen. Uh, blood work is gonna be near normal, but the very definition of clinical cancer says you will have liver mets and bone mets, et cetera, and these metastases will give you abnormal blood tests. Very commonly, 
brain metastases are excluded uh, in clinical studies uh, or you have to be off steroids, the real doc in the real world can't, uh, can't, can't exclude patients. They have to treat those who come. So what happens in clinical trials, the patients are not the same as they are in the real world. Uh, patients in the real world um, probably have faster growing cancers and greater tumor burden in general. So you might expect that, um, that, that they might have a worse host station or subjectively a more advanced stage of disease. Only 2% of patients in the U.S. end up on clinical studies and uh, to think that the real world outcomes should reflect those in clinical trials is just plain wrong. When you're running a clinical trial, your goal is to prove a point of principle. So you can highly select a patient and prove a principle, and you can prove that point actually works in that selected population of patients. But it's not true that it translates 100% into real world. So where are we in the treatment of lung cancer? Well, I would say lung cancer is now the model for most cancers, and we've had dramatic improvements. I talk about then, and I'm gonna pick NCCN guidelines for uh, October of 2016. In 2016, while we did understand EGFR and ALK, in the wild type group, um, we, we were actually giving erlotinib, uh, an EGFR inhibitor, but we were giving it non-selectively. We didn't necessarily give it to patients who had just the EGFR mutations. We were giving it to everybody. So standard therapy at the end of 2016 was a doublet platinum-based chemotherapy, and if that uh, didn't work, you moved on, or when it didn't work, you moved on to single agent chemotherapy. Um, and that didn't work. Everybody got an EGFR inhibitor, whether or not they had an EGFR mutation. So where are we now? Um, well, now very different. Uh, now everybody who walks in the door gets a molecular profile. First thing we do is broad molecular profiling, and we look for EGFR, ALK, ROS1, BRAF, NTREC, RET mutations, et cetera. And those patients are considered almost a different disease. Their driving mutation is different and they tend to be non-smokers. Those patients are treated uh, very differently and are less likely to respond to immune therapy. So we are automatically doing a biomarker, a molecular biomarker, and profiling the cancer and making it into a bunch of different cancers. The second step we do is we profile our patients for immune status. And largely, there'll be a whole group of these as time goes by, but presently we're looking at PDL1. And what we're trying to understand is how do the, circ how do the cancer circumvent um, our own immune system? And by testing the tumor cells for the presence of PDL1, an immune checkpoint inhibitor, uh, you can guess that that's the way the cancer circumvented our own immune system. So if you have a PDL1 high status and they pick a number of 50%, uh, you can get an immunotherapy alone and find that an immunotherapy is more effective than chemotherapy. If you are one to 49%, um, the effects are still there, but not quite as great. And so typically in that situation, patients are getting a chemo immunotherapy as a standard of care. And if your PDL1 is low, less than 1%, you're getting a chemo immunotherapy uh, across the board. So treatment right now, the big immunotherapy distinction is largely at PDL1 greater than 50%. And in that situation, you get immunotherapy either by itself or immunotherapy with chemotherapy. The rest of the groups are chemo immunotherapy given together. So with that, um, you can see that immunotherapy is part of every first line standard treatment in non-small cell lung cancer. So what's the history of immunotherapy? Um, again, 2016 was kind of a big date. Everything changed. Nivolumab was improved, uh, approved for squamous cancer first as a second line therapy 
uh, and then NEVO was approved for non-squamous cell. Um, shortly, and, and these left in black um, are, are listed in black because they are, um, they are uh, they're approved for all situations. Those below the line, pembrolizumab was approved for second line, but rather than being unselected, pembrolizumab said, uh, we don't want to do it unless we see some evidence of a biomarker being present at greater than 1%. Um, as time passed by, pembrolizumab at uh, greater than 50% uh, demonstrated that it was superior to chemotherapy, and this was the first one to jump into first-line uh, therapy. Um, chemoimmuno was approved in 2018, and uh, since then, a second chemoimmunotherapy trial has been developed, the uh, four-drug combination of Atizo and Bevacizumab. Uh, Dervalumab got approved for stage three disease. Um, and, and then on top of that, um, we've even moved on to other chemoimmunotherapies up front, and just recently, nivolumab and ipilimumab, a dual immunotherapy, no chemotherapy, was also approved. So the point is, again, just like in the last slide, immunotherapy is all over the world, and it's made its approvals by demonstrating in clinical trials in selected patients that it is effective. Uh, the two studies that demonstrate in clinical trials the marked effectiveness of this are the Keynote 042. This was for first line, non small cell, when your PDL1 marker on the tumor was greater than 50%. And this study shows uh, pembrolizumab in blue with a 20 month median overall survival in chemotherapy, which was in red at 12 months median overall survival. So a hazard ratio of 0.69, pretty big improvement. Chemotherapy was inferior to a immunotherapy or an immune checkpoint inhibitor in a select population of patients. Uh, the second study says, well, suppose you don't have a 50% PDL1, and this is Keynote 189, and this was Pemetrexa, carboplatin, and pembrolizumab uh, in all comers versus chemotherapy alone. And those, in fact, who did have chemotherapy alone, when they progressed, they were allowed to go on to other treatments, and the majority of them did. But again, immune therapy in this situation had a hazard ratio uh, for overall survival of 0.56 and a doubling of median survival. So if one looks at these two New England Journal of Medicine papers, or one is JCO, one's Lancet, I apologize. Um, if you look at these two papers that were subsequently in different versions updated, um, the improvement by the addition of immunotherapy is remarkable in the selected population of patients that were chosen for the clinical trial. Um, well, where does that fit in? Real world observation. Well, flat iron, I participate also in flat iron studies. This is not one of mine. Um, but in this uh, paper by Kojen, they looked at uh, a review of electronic medical records um, in a private practice dominantly real world situation. And they looked at survival that included the patients they treated. And the PDL1 statuses are listed here. And you see that no matter whether your PDL1 is extremely high or extremely low, um, doesn't make a huge difference. Um, however, and the median survival in the best of these real world patients is about 10 months. And we just got through saying, you can see here on the right, that chemoimmunotherapy um, approached 20 months. And uh, immunotherapy alone was in the uh, was, is in the 20 month range, and so this real world demonstration of immunotherapy um, doesn't match what happens in a clinical trial. So 
it's important to understand why these differences happen. We don't necessarily live in the clinical trial world. Our job is to go and treat real patients. So we'll introduce the host immune classifier here, and that's the subject of the ASCO presentation. Um, the host immune classifier is a blood-based um, test that measures chronic inflammation in the blood. And we classify it as either hot or cold. And we believe that chronic a, a cold or chronic inflammation in the blood leads for a cold tumor microenvironment um, that is largely reflective of immune suppressors, uh, Tregs, myeloid-derived stem cells, um, an M2 macrophage status versus um, those who don't have chronic immune uh, a classifier who are hot or don't have these immune suppressive proteins, their microenvironments um, have an immune uh, ability uh, to have the appropriate cells there that do not have a suppressive environment and immune checkpoints can work. So host immune classifier as hot um, is the normal patient that we see, and a host immune classifier as cold has chronic inflammation and in theory shouldn't work as well uh, in immune therapy. And in fact, uh, we have data that shows that it doesn't work as well um, in any situation, that there is a prognostic element to the host immune classifier. So the study INSIGHT is a unique study. It's a registry study. They just captured everybody. I am a participant in this study, and I put apparently nearly 300 patients on this study for my institution. Um, but this study is a registry study. Every patient who walks in at any stage is allowed to participate. Uh, they have a blood-based tumor and immune profile uh, collected. Uh, it didn't include patients with EGFR mutations. But as a registry, all this data is collected prospectively. One can go back um, and use and, and examine it both forward and backward. Physicians right now are using it for uh, treatment decision impact, and they can measure that and decide how well it affects or how it doesn't affect the physician. We can look at patient outcomes, and that's what we'll be talking about. They're looking at longitudinal testing. And it's a great opportunity to uh, look at the utility of next generation proteomic testing um, going forward. So with this registry, um, they collected data and had an um, interim analysis. And they presented the data just at ASCO last weekend. And this data included 3,258 patients. Um, 1975 have enough data to have one year follow up, and therefore you can actually do survival analysis. 1446 had advanced stage non small cell lung cancer. So the majority of these patients have metastatic disease. Um, 877 had first line therapy, uh, were entered as first line treatment. Uh, 587 entered as second or greater line therapy. So the subject of the topic we're talking about for immune therapy is the 877 patients who receive first-line immunotherapy. Of those, um, 284 received an immune checkpoint inhibitor alone um, or in combination, and um, 392 had platinum-based chemotherapy. And that 877 is the subject we'll be looking at through the rest of this. So patient demographics of these 877 patients, um, they're pretty much what you'd expect. The, the age is 68, uh, slightly more males than females. Smoking status, you know that most patients who were smokers have quit in the US. Um, there was only 11% never smokers, and current smokers included 40% of the patients. Histology is dominated by adenocarcinoma, Squamous comes in uh, a little bit lower. The disease stage between uh, the wet 3B, old school, versus discrete metastasis is uh, 80 as 90 to 10. Um, and 
And, and the usual presentation of bone mets, 20%, brain mets, 20%. Um, performance status is something that I just like to call out. What is the performance status of patients in the real world? Well, the patients who participated in the study in first-line therapy, uh, so 25 and 50%, 75% of the patients, in fact, had performance status zero of one would have likely been allowed to participate in an immune therapy. Performance status two was 21% and PS3 was 4%. Um, so a full quarter of the patients by performance status alone, without all of the other eligibility criteria we described earlier, um, would not have been allowed. So the big difference right off the bat um, between real world and um, approved pharma-based national studies um, is a quarter of the patients in the real world couldn't have made it on performance status alone, not to mention any of the other criteria. Histologies here, 70% um, adenocarcinoma that we mentioned uh, before, 20% uh, squam, and another 12% of not otherwise specified. The treatment regimens are listed here. So um, immune checkpoint inhibitor monotherapy, 167, 117 patients, immune uh, ICI combination, 167, and platinum-based chemotherapy, 400. So that's the, the group that we will be looking at, and we can draw inferences from that data. So right off the bat, how did the two groups uh, survive? Um, Platinum-based chemotherapy is the black curve, and immunotherapy, regardless of how it was given, is the gray curve. And if you look at these, the darn curves cross halfway through. The addition of immunotherapy used in first-line real-world patients um, who participated in this study didn't show an improvement in survival. Uh, statistically, was uh, not significant. So that's the first point, real-world patients with immune therapy haven't had quite as much benefit as one might have expected. Survivals in this group were still pretty good. It was um, uh, 12 months, you can see here on the right, it was uh, in the INSIGHT registry study, it was 12 months versus 14 um, at the highest level. Um, but that's chemotherapy versus immunotherapy. Clinical characteristics now, so, so right off the bat, um, immunotherapy hasn't made a huge difference. If we look at these patients, um, can we go one step further? And we said, can we classify them by this uh, immune classifier? Um, so we will look at those who are hot and those who are cold. We said those who are cold are those who have um, chronic inflammatory proteins circulating in the blood. Um, and in age, really no difference. Um, in gender, there was a slight uh, additional number of patients um, who were uh, who were cold, who were male. Histology uh, statistically significant, but in the but in the bigger picture. Um, there was uh, squame seems to be the one who pick, who was cold, but again, it's not an all or none thing by any means. Stage between 3B and 4 didn't make a difference. And by, um, and by performance status, the p-value is 0.07. So there was no major difference. But if you look at the subgroups, um, PS zeros, there was almost 20% of PS zeros, these super healthy patients, who had a cold um, HIC or an um, PS1, 30% had it. PS2, still patients that would be treating um, fully 36% and 37% with PS3. So these, uh, a cold immune classifier um, shows up in all performance status and performance status here um, does not correlate um, with with your host immune classifier. Uh, treatments here, uh, there were subtle differences, um, and that's to be expected because the physicians were actually making picks, but largely based on PDL1. 
So what happens when you look at this host immune classifier um, in first line therapy? In platinum based therapy, you see that the hot did much better than the coals, and I think my, my cursor is showing that. Um, so even though immunotherapy uh, didn't make a big difference, um, when we look at chemotherapy alone, the host immune classifier picked up patients um, who did remarkably well, a hazard ratio of 0.56, kind of seven months versus 15 months, a full doubling. So that's the prognostic element of this. If you look at all immune checkpoint inhibitors, again, a remarkable difference. Um, if you had a poor or a cold status, oops, if you had a cold status, um, your median survival was under six months. If you had a warm status, it was not reached. And so the immune classifier gives you a hazard ratio of 0.38. So the lower, the more important, and it says that this is, is this can pick out the patients who are going to do poorly when they receive immune therapy or chemotherapy. But the difference between the two, it picks out the patients who are going to do worse in the immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment or in immunotherapy um, with greater uh, distinction than it does in a chemo world. Um, well, how about the types of immunotherapy that you're receiving? So if you receive immunotherapy, monotherapy, these are the patients who are PDL1 greater than 50%, huge difference. It says that if you are cold, the blue line, these patients live three months. Um, the the, the immunopembrolizumab first line therapy didn't do anything. Um, those who were uh, had an immune classifier as hot, they did well. Um, they're they're beyond a year and a half for median survivals. On the other hand, if you received chemoimmunotherapy, um, the same distinction was seen, but to a somewhat lesser degree. These patients live more than six months, even in the cold status. And in the um, absence of chronic inflammatory proteins, um, their immune treatment hasn't been reached. So the immune classifier picks out those who don't do as well with immune therapy. How are the PDL1 statuses in this group split? Well, we know it's about a third, a third, and a third between greater than 50%, one to 49, and less than. And that would be the all patient group as one might expect. But in the ICI monotherapy, you know that um, those patients happen, are typically PDL1 high. And you can see here the majority of them were. But when one is giving chemoimmunotherapy, um, PDL1 status isn't a requirement. And they fall into the third, the third, and the third. So they are reflective of the real world patients. Uh, so next is the host immune classifier and PDL1 status. And so you see that 50%, 1 to 49, and 1% in the hot on the left and the cold on the right, there is no difference. So the host immune classifier is completely independent of PDL1 status. And then subcategories, if one looks at this, what jumps out? Well, um, those who do better are to the right of the line of identity uh, listed here. And the hazard ratio gives some estimate of how great the distinguisher is. And the most important distinguisher here is the host immune classifier um, at 2.72, much greater than any of the other numbers. And you can see out here um, that those who are hot do way better than those who are cold. It's got a p-value with a number of zeros. Performance status is interesting. Um, in this one, they compared the zero versus one. And typically, the doctors claim that a zero and one are very close to being the same. Um, but surprisingly, uh, the PS1 did a little bit worse here, um, not statistically significant. So it says what the doctors say, that the zeros and ones are largely the same. It does cross the line of identity. Now, PS2. Um, versus one, um, the, the ones do a little bit better as one would expect, 
Um, and that's the reason these patients are excluded from clinical trials. Uh, when one looks at age, statistically significant, P01, um, and younger patients do a little bit better. Um, same thing here, adeno versus squame, uh, not statistically significant, but there is a trend toward the adenos doing somewhat better than the squames, uh, and the not otherwise specified doing a little bit worse. Within the immunochemotherapy group versus monotherapy, this is an important one here. So if you take the whole group in a multivariate analysis, the immunochemotherapy um, is statistically improved um, with better survival outcomes than the ICI monotherapy alone. Now, that's not what is part of the NCCN guidelines, but in a real world data set that we have here, this is likely the first time uh, to go and say that um, a clinical study that I'm not aware has been performed, but overall, ICI monotherapy is inferior um, to immunochemotherapy based on this retrospective look at prospectively collected data. Um, within your PDL1 group, whether you are high or low, it didn't really uh, play out as being an important factor. Uh, never smokers versus ever smokers did not statistically show a big benefit. Stage didn't play out, and gender, which is often considered uh, females doing better than males as a prognostic factor in the real world, didn't make much difference. So um, in, in the slide on the left, we look at immunomonotherapy and plotted out by pdl one status. This is the standard of treatment. We make our decisions based on pdl one status. Um, you can see the group that did the best was actually the pdl one negative. Um, the group that kind of fell in the middle was the pdl one high. And so in the immune monotherapy group, um, this data shows that pdl one status um, is not a real prognostic indicator. It didn't really uh, make a huge difference. It's not statistically significant. But in those patients who received monotherapy and they were PDL1 high, um, you can look at the HIC. And then we said this before, but the host immune modifier picks a group of patients who will do as well as predicted in the national clinical studies. That's the high group. And it looks at a real world population that are gonna do awfully um, those cold and uh, they don't behave like those patients who are participating in the national clinical trials. So real world data is different. Same thing here for those who get immunochemotherapy. We look at PDL1 status here and um, you can see that the PDL1 high group um, there does do somewhat better, um, but, but it's not as big a prognostic indicator as one would think. Uh, there's substantial overlap, and so PDL1 is not the biomarker that we would like to think. If you look at the PDL1 high chemotherapy and then break it down by the host immune classifier, Statistically very different, um, hazard ratio of 0.6, and there is a trend towards an improvement, um, but clearly that trend says the cold patients don't do as well. So if you take these two charts and put them together, so this is PDL1 high patients who got monotherapy, and you classify them by HIC hot or cold, the same thing. PDL1 high patients, you classify them by hot or cold, the hots do well um, in the PDL1 setting, but the colds do less than three months uh, if you get monotherapy, and it looks like you'll likely exceed six months if you get chemoimmunotherapy. And so I, I look at that and say, I'll take a doubling of survival anytime. But it strikes me that PDL1 cold, uh, a PDL1 high, but an HIC cold 
that patient doesn't do well, and uh, this is clearly a host immune classifier uh, that shows who won't do well with these treatments. Um, so conclusions, number one, um, in the real world, not in clinical studies, chemotherapy, immunotherapy seem to do about the same. Um, clinical trials have demonstrated marked improvements in those patients um, with immunotherapy, but these marked improvements are much, much less blunted using real-world patients. Um, number two, the overall survival of chemoimmunotherapy uh, was longer than those with immunotherapy alone. Um, so, and we would argue that immunochemotherapy is a better choice in a certain select population, um, but maybe overall. Um, third is immunochemotherapy was similar to immunotherapy in the PDL1 high if you have a hot label. And if you have a cold label, a marker of chronic inflammatory disease, uh, you do very poor, especially if one is given an immunomonotherapy alone. So where does that fit? Well, current day standard um, NCCN guidelines state that you have metastatic or advanced cancer. You should genotype first, as listed here. Um, but then you should make a distinction based on PDL1 status, and and you should get immunotherapy alone or chemoimmunotherapy if you are PDL1 high, and everybody else ought to get chemoimmunotherapy. If you were to add the immune classifier on top of this, um, it would change things. We agree that in the host immune classifier hot situation, which is the majority of patients, um, that the guideline recommendations are appropriate. But if you have an HIC cold status, which is not an insignificant population of patients, you saw that um, it was as high as a third of the patients um, in some of the situations. Um, and you were to give, and you have a PDL1 high, and you gave them immunotherapy alone, you would end up with inferior survival. So the recommendations based on this could be looked at in one of two ways. Um, if you have a cold uh, identifier, you should get chemoimmunotherapy in reasonably in all groups, and that's what I think most clinicians would do. But the data takes it one step further, and the data says that um, if you have a cold marker, chemotherapy probably does just as well. So if you were satisfying physicians, I'm sure that they would prefer the chemoimmunotherapy, but that's somewhat because of uh, some, some brainwashing. Um, if you look at the data, if you have an HIC cold signature, you could get chemotherapy alone, and there could be huge implications for cost uh, going forward if one were to consider um, such a guideline. So exciting data as far as I'm concerned and practice changing in many ways. Questions? So thank you, Dr. Ackerley, for the really great presentation. And we are starting to have some questions come through the chat box. Um, let's get started with the first question. Uh, what does the host immune classifier measure? So don't know all the answers to that. Um, I've been around even longer than some of the people in the company. Um, but the, the original presentation, um, they were going to solve the world. If you could figure out what it was that was present in the blood that was making these patients do worse, you could make a drug against that, and life would be perfect. Um, their original analysis um, said that uh, serum amyloid A was the dominant component of four of the eight proteins they measure, and probably closer to six of the eight. And uh, Linda informed me this morning that some of these look at complement also. So the point is, while they did a proteomic analysis, black box, find out what protein peaks were responsible for this poor outcome, um, they've gone back and identified them to identify their function. 
and all of those that they're able to identify fall into an inflammatory pattern or a wound healing type of or complement based pattern, but they're all evidence of chronic inflammation. Uh, Linda, you might be able to even give me a better answer than that. Uh, no, I, actually, I think you did a great job answering it. You and I have had many conversations over the years as we've learned more about the um, host immune classifier, also, again, known as, um, commercially known as the Verisrat test. That, um, and, and I think I, it's just important to remember that it's the machine learning algorithm that converts it to a clinical test. And that takes into to account not only the, the identity of the proteins or the proteins that are used in the, in the algorithm, but the relationship between them, which is why we think there's such a strong, more broad uh, correlation to systemic chronic inflammation. Uh, and as the data bear out and, and pile up, it looks as though it might be a potentially a surrogate for um, the immunosuppressed or the cold tumor microenvironment. So I, I think you, you nailed it. <laughs> Um, the next question, uh, I guess, might be for me, is the host immune classifier commercially available? Again, uh, HIC is commercially available by Biodesics as the Verisrat test. You can go to the website to get more information um, uh, if you would like to, to know more about the, the test and its availability and its coverage, et cetera. Um, the only thing I would say, it's been around for a while. Initially, it uh, launched as uh, what uh, a predictive test TKI therapy and second line non small cell lung cancer. We're up to almost 50,000 Verisrat uh, tests run on patients. And inside a lot, we're over 3,500 patients. As Dr. Akerley said in the beginning, we tested within the Insight study almost 300. Um, really, the clinical utility has expanded for this test. We're, we're uh, evaluating performance um, uh, more broadly because of its strong correlation to. Um, the inflammatory status of cancer, um, that it, it really is linked to um, being responsive to immune therapy. Do you want to add anything to that, Dr. Akerley? Uh, no, I, I, if this, was, if this was a black box to pick who was going to do better. And, um, and, and in the big picture, it absolutely picks who's going to do better not just prognostic now, it can go and say, geez, in an immune situation, um, it can pick out those who are going to do far better. So it is prognostic and predictive. From a clinician standpoint, I very much don't care about the pure statistical issues. I'm trying to decide all the time, how long is a patient going to live? Are they going to have enough time to get first-line therapy and a second-line therapy? It's clear that second-line therapies are effective in non-small cell lung cancer and potentially third lines. Um, but if the patient has such a poor prognosis, um, they may not get onto second line and not necessarily be able to reap the benefits of second line. Um, so, so it changes my practice uh, significantly. Um, potential clinical trials could spin off this um, to argue that if you do have a poor prognostic signature um, and aren't going to do as well, might you consider potentially um, a more early evaluation of the effectiveness of the treatment you're using and consider uh, switching over earlier? Great, and I think that may, uh, the, your last slide and that your summary just now may have answered this question, but I'll go ahead and pose it just in case you want to um, add anything um, to that. And how do you envision the test being used in clinical practice? Oh, um, I, think, I think it should be presented to NCCN for guideline purposes. Um, mm -hmm. I personally will no longer treat a pdl one high patient with who has a cold signature, I will no longer treat that patient with immunotherapy alone. So that is a practice changing uh, statement for me right off the bat. And, um, and this does pick out a group of patients who don't do as well. Um, I have a published study from some years back, but we were trying to define in a real, we were trying to look at real world. I didn't realize we were looking at that at the time, but we tried to pick a patient, group of patients 
who could go on clinical study to define how well they could do, what's the upper limit of normal. So we set up a whole group of criteria like a clinical study would and said, you have to be the superstar clinical trials patient. We had serum left over and, um, and while the group of patients did extremely well, and retrospectively, it turns out a large fraction of them had EGFR, so this was before the EGFR understanding, um, the HIC classifier, um, although we said they were super performance status, super everything, it picked out a group of patients uh, it said would do poorly, and in fact, they did do poorly. So I think it's important to know who will do well and who will do poorly, and this makes a big difference. Absolutely. Well, I believe that is all of the questions that we have um, for you today. Again, we really sincerely appreciate you giving um, an overview of the insight data, uh, focusing specifically, oh, looks like, sorry, we do have another question that just popped up. Would the ICIs uh, help and add more benefits to metastatic patients uh, based on this data set? Yeah, so if based on this data set, um, it says that it says that there's a group who's going to do well with immune therapy and a group that's not going to do well with immune therapy. Um, if you were to give the patient the right treatment, um, you're going to do better overall in the long run. If you are to give the patient the wrong treatment, you're not likely to benefit the patient, but you will add toxicity. So this has a way of improving efficacy by picking the right group of patients who will benefit and a way of decreasing toxicity by limiting therapy in those patients who aren't going to benefit. All right, and that looks like the last question. So again, I want to uh, thank you for your great presentation today of the insight uh, interim analysis of the advanced stage patients receiving frontline immunotherapy and combination therapy. I think we learned a lot about how um, additional biomarkers are clearly needed and immune status uh, plays a key role in treatment selection. Um, I want to uh, also end the presentation with thanking all of the INSIGHT study sites. There are over 30 uh, sites across the U.S. who are involved, the research staff, the patients, the patient's families who are participating in this trial. I think it's an important trial. We're over 3,500 patients enrolled. We're continuing to enroll in this study. Um, and I think the data will only get more informative uh, as we go. So we'll continue to look at it uh, annually as we get more and more follow-up for these patients. And um, really, I think the purpose of keeping this study open is the treatment landscape for uh, lung cancer is changing annually, uh, almost um, for a while there, almost uh, every six months, we would get a new therapy, and we're starting to see a surge now. So I think this is critical to really start to um, have important um, uh, tools to profile the, the patient to select the right therapies when there's so many options now. So thank you, Dr. Akerley, for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much.